Hi and welcome to this module on managing a project schedule. Well, it's not just managing, it's how to create a project schedule, how to put together the famous Gantt chart, how to do network diagrams, how to do critical path method and figure out the critical path and all that. So it's quite a compli complicated uh, module. It's uh, along with this module and along with the earned value management module, they're probably the two most complex. But uh, once again, these are introductory modules intended to introduce you to the concepts and give you enough information to start doing the work. And certainly by the end of this module, you will have enough information to feel confident putting together your project schedule, uh, putting together a Gantt chart and using software to do that. And just on that, I'll repeat myself uh, a few times, but there's another separate uh, recording of a screenshot, or screen, yeah, uh, a screen capture of me putting together a basic Gantt chart using the Project Libre software, which is a free piece of um, software, which we'll talk about in this module. So at the end of this module, you can also go and check that screen capture out of me actually um, you know, getting in there and assembling a Gantt chart so you can reinforce the concepts there. But look, let's get underway. Um, my goal with this module is at the end of it, you have the tools and techniques um, and the confidence to put together an accurate, realistic, transparent project schedule. That's what we want. And all of those things sound like they should be expected, but often they're not. Because unfortunately in the real world, we see a lot of work done like at the beginning of a project to initiate it um, and initial planning to convince people you know what you're doing and here's a project schedule and isn't it wonderful and then often when it's done it's just completely forgotten about um, not updated or updated so infrequently and then of course everybody gets really surprised um, oh how did we finish um, how, how, how did we finish pine schedule how did we finish late oh if only we could have known this well you could have known this if you put together a project schedule and kept it updated and compared what you originally thought versus what was actually happening as well. So that's what we want you to do. And the primary way we're going to get you to do this is, of course, the magical, mystical Gantt chart. Um, the funny story I do like to tell here is once I was teaching some students and um, I asked what Gantt stood for, G-A-N-T-T. And I had one student um, get up and uh, look me straight in the eye and tell me that it stood for graphical analysis and numerical something technique. And they just couldn't remember what the other T was about. And I asked them, are you sure about that? And they said, yep, absolutely. They knew the sort of graphical analysis and numerical something technique. And I pointed out, well, no, it's actually the surname of Henry Gant the uh, engineer in the early part of the 20th century who put this particular graphical presentation together. The student wasn't happy um, and still insisted they were right. But the truth is, Mr. Gant down there in the bottom right hand corner, that's him down here, Mr. Henry L. Gant. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, he was the first to be credited with using this. I don't know if he's the first to do it. but. I want to break this down now for you, what, exactly what it is. Um, let's take a close look because if people just think the Gantt chart is, that's where you start, but it's not, it's actually built on two other documents or two other charts. It's actually combining two other charts. Over here, we have our work breakdown structure. That's that. What that's what that is. And then you know, you've got your top level there, the new house. Then you've got um, second level, design phase, pricing phase, consenting phase, and building phase. And then you've got your third level, which is the, all these tasks here. So this is your work breakdown structure. And all this information here is the information we're going to put into our network diagram. Also, we'll also include the predecessors there. Here we've got task durations and any predecessor relationships. So this information is our work breakdown structure. This information here is our network diagram. Now you combine the work breakdown structure and the network diagram, you get a Gantt chart. How do I know this? Well, I can prove it to you. Um, this is a screenshot from Project Libre, by the way, which I'm going to introduce you to. Looks just like Microsoft Project. Um, it's a great bit of software. It opens Microsoft Project files, saves as Microsoft Project. It's completely free, open source, and completely supported. So I do recommend it, and I'll give you that link shortly. But if you take a look here, 
you'll actually see you can view this information as either the network diagram or the WBS. Because that's essentially, as I said, what a Gantt chart is. It is the combination of the work breakdown structure and the network diagram. So there we are. So that's what it is. Look, by the end of this module, you'll feel confident to get in and start playing around with software, whether it's Project Libre or Microsoft Project or Primavera or any of the other great bits of software. And we can all thank Mr. Gantt. Um, I'm sure he didn't, obviously he didn't have a computer, so he was doing this all with graph paper and pencils and paper and that. Um, our software now does it a whole lot better than that. So that's our, that's our goal. So how are we going to get there? We've got some steps to get through to get there. Well, first up, we're going to define our activities. Now, this is the information we're going to get from our project scope statement and our work breakdown structure. We're going to take and then break it down further to activity levels. Once we've defined them, we've got an activity list. We're then going to sequence them, which means putting them in order, um, defining the predecessor and the successor relationships, which ac activities come first, which activities come after that first, second, third, and what are the relationships between them? Um, we're also going to estimate the duration of our activities. And to do this, we're going to use those estimating techniques we covered in the estimating technique module. So if you haven't done that module, you will need to, um, because we're just going to pass over it very quickly here. But go back and have a look at those 10 different estimating techniques, um, because you'll be able to use those to estimate individual activity duration. So we've defined the activities, sequenced them, estimated the durations, and then we can prepare the project schedule. Now we're going to use the network diagram, specifically the activity or node network diagram. That is the most common. There is another diagram which we're not going to touch on, which is called the activity on arrow diagram, only because it doesn't make any sense. Um, the way they display the information is counterintuitive, I think. So pretty much 99% of the world uses the activity on node diagram. You might still find some old dinosaurs out there that insist that the activity on arrow format is better, but it's not. Activity on node is what we're going to use. So we're going to construct the network diagram. And from that, once we've done that and constructed the network diagram, then we can use um, critical path method to figure out the critical path. And we'll explain why it's called the critical path. So let's start at the top with defining the activity, taking the first step um, to building our schedule. Um, basically, what we're going to do here is take a look at our scope statement. We're going to take a look at our work breakdown structure and do some further decomposition down to activity level where we can. And again, just stressing, if we can't, we probably don't probably want to put too much effort into planning there. And any planning that we do around duration will have a higher uncertainty in it. But for those activities, we can break down to activity level. We will have a great deal of certainty about the duration in them. So that's the first thing we want to do is take those activities um, and create an activity list, which is what we need. So I've mocked up just a very quick example, very generic example of what an activity list may look like for a house building project. So here what we've got, if you could imagine each one of these is in fact, I don't know, a post-it note up on a wall somewhere. Um, We've asked the team to break down the activities from the scope statement, the work breakdown structure, and list all the activities we need to do. Now, obviously, if you imagine if this was all manual and it was up on a wall somewhere, that's not a schedule yet. No, that is simply a list of activities. We may choose to organise them by um, phase, or we may choose to organise them by who's responsible or things like that. But it's not our schedule yet. It is just a plain old list of activities. Um, you'll often find this as a text document, you know, with lots of activities listed and a bit more information and some numbers and things like that. But that's essentially our first step. So whether you're using Microsoft Excel or Word and a table or post-it notes, you'll end up with an activity list. Okay, list of all the activities. But that's not our schedule yet. And if you look back to our Gantt chart, you'll see this is where our activity list appears. Here they all are, here. These are all our activities. Obviously, this is at the third level of the WBS. There's the top level, second level, and this is the third level. And these are our activities. So um, our concept plans, our owner's approval, our plans for construction, plans to build. It's a list of our activities. In this case, all ordered by the process or phase of the project that they come after, uh, after or under, sorry. 
what you'll, hopefully what you've noticed is you're now not looking at Project Libre anymore. This is a screenshot from Microsoft Project, and it does look very similar to Project Libre as well. So um, there we are. So there's our activity list. Now you can choose to put them straight into Microsoft Project or Project Libre and then order them later on, like reorganize them. You can do drag and drop and cut and paste and move them all around. Um, or you could put them into an Excel spreadsheet, list them all because you can import Excel data into both Project and into Project Libre as well. So however you want to put your activity list together, it's up to you. But we know that eventually we want it to end up in one of these bits of software. Okay, so that's our activity list. That's the first step in doing our particular project schedule. The next thing we want to do is sequence the activities. So we want to take all the activities, we want to figure out the order in which we have to do them. Which ones have to be done first, which ones have to be done second, third, fourth, and what's the relationship between those activities? When can they start based on when the predecessors finished? So that's our next step is to take our activities and sequence them. And here we have some of the activities sequenced. So the first one is planned submitted to council, then council processing, council approval, begin construction, excavation, foundation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've sequenced them, put them in the order in which they will have to occur. But there's a bit more to it than that. So let's take a closer look at some of them. Now, this activity here, submitting the plans to council, is a predecessor activity to council processing. Council processing is a successor to plans submitted to council. So the activity that comes before another activity is called a predecessor. The activity that comes after another activity is called a successor. But an activity can be both of those. So for example, council approval is a successor the council processing that comes after that, but it's a predecessor to beginning construction. So that's the language I'm going to use, predecessor and successor. Now, the other thing that we're going to do is to look at the types of precedence relationships between predecessors and successors, because I've given you the impression here that you do this, you start it, you finish it, then you start it and finish that, and you start it and finish that, and once that one's finished, you can start that one, and once that one's finished, you can start that one. That's called a finish to start relationship. Okay, so we'll take a closer look at that now. Because there are, in fact, different types of relationships between different activities. Most of the time, in fact, 99% of all of your career, you're going to deal with finish to start relationships. Well, if not 99%, 95%. So most of the relationships you deal with are finished to start, and this simply means that the successor activity can't start until the predecessor activity finishes. So it's a finish to start. And the software will show a box like this, which indicates duration of each. And the left hand side of the box is the start. A little F there, and, a, and the right hand side of the box represents the finish and the start and the finish, because this is project duration of each of these. These might be 10 days long, each of these. And what this indicates, the arrow will always appear clearly showing the relationship. So in this case, you know this is finished to start because the arrow comes out of the predecessor here, the finish, and it goes to the start of the successor. So that's finished to start. So B cannot start until A has finished. Okay. Now also here that you can have finish to finish, in which case, remember this side is the start and this side is the finish. Start and finish. In this case, B can't finish until A has finished. So the arrow comes out of the finish and goes around here to the finish. So B has to wait for something A is producing before it can finish. So I'm just trying to think of an example of that. Um, what would be an example of that? Okay, so an example of finish to finish would be um, uh, a book production company and the task of binding the book can't finish um, the binding can't be completed until the printing is complete. So binding can start while printing is still being done. 
but you can't finish the binding process before the printing is fully complete. So that's that's a very simple example. Just you have to wait for something, but you can start it before the end of it. You can start it, you just can't finish it until the predecessor finishes. And the other one, um, the other most common is the start to start relationship, which means that activity B can't start until activity A starts. And the very simple one on this one is um, house building with uh, a foundation. So activity A could be lay the foundation, activity B could be erect the framework. Um, now you don't have to wait for all of the foundation to be laid. In fact, you could start laying the foundation after the foundation has started and done a little bit of work. You can start doing that as well. So that's start to start. Um, now, as I said, 95% of everything you do, God, I hate these things, make sure that, will be finished to start. 3% uh, of what you'll do will be finished to finish. And two, no, no, 1. 1. 1.9, sorry, get rid of that. 1.9% of what you do will be start to start. There is a fourth one, which I refuse to teach because it's just ridiculous and I've never come across it. And I think it's more theoretical than anything else. And that's start to finish. Um, which just know that it exists, but you don't ever need to use it because basically what it's saying is that um, the predecessor can't finish until the successor, no, the successor can't finish until the predecessor starts, which, which makes no sense at all. Um, if we were to draw it um, just very quickly, it would look something, you know, like, um, I'm going to draw, if that was the predecessor, and that was the successor. Um, it would be a start to. It look like that, which doesn't make any sense. I don't know why that is the predecessor, not the successor in that case. Um, and look, I've been trying to teach this for years, and every textbook that tries to explain it comes up with a strange thing of security changing over or running a, a, a relay race. So just know that it exists, but you're going to be dealing primarily with um, finish to start. Okay. Um, there are some other things apart from precedence. You just need to be aware that there are also types of dependencies that you may want to indicate. Um, a mandatory dependency means between a predecessor and a successor that you can't do the successor until the predecessor is finished. So you can't build the second floor of a house before you build the first. That's mandatory. It's just impossible to do it. A discretionary means you shouldn't do the successor activity until the predecessor has finished. You shouldn't. But if you're looking for ways to shorten or compress the schedule, you might take on a bit of extra risk and do the successor at the same time or shortly after the predecessor, but certainly don't wait for the end. So you shouldn't install the carpet in a house until you've painted the walls. But if you press for time, maybe you could put in place um, some, you know, uh, screening systems or carpet covering systems to protect it until you while you're painting walls at the same time. So discretionary activities is generally what we want to go looking at for our first port of call when we're looking to compress the schedule. Um, external dependencies is where something in your project is waiting on um, something from outside your project or organisation. Um, so consenting, you know, building consent or legislative consent from local or central government um, is often or permit or something like that. These are external dependencies. They will be identified as activities in your schedule, but you can't control them. So you might mark them as external. And then internal just means you're waiting on other people within your organization who aren't part of your project team. So you might be waiting for finance approval or um, the HR department to release people or something like that. So you can mark it so you can communicate the stakeholders what are the mandatory, the discretionary, the internal and external um, dependencies. So what we actually do, we put all of this sequencing together, we actually come up with something tidier than what I showed you a couple of slides ago. We start to end up with what's called the network diagram. And here we're using the precedence diagramming method, particularly the, um, I'll write that there, activity on node AON diagram. That's what we're using. And what that means is we're representing the activities on the nodes, the information about the activities on the node, which is in this case, the, the box there. 
um, and the arrows indicate relationships between different activities. Because um, as I mentioned earlier on, there is another method called the activity on arrow um, we don't use. I know that when I started teaching PMP exam prep way back in 2005, we had to teach candidates both activity on node and activity on arrow. But shortly after that, I think it was only a year or two after that, um, the Project Management Institute dropped activity on arrow from the PMBOK guide just because, um, well, not very many people use it. And also, it's counterintuitive. Graphically, it doesn't make sense. Um, anyway, so this is the activity on node diagram. Um, and this is what shows the paths through a network diagram. This is a network diagram. So we've got the beginning of the project, we've got the end of the project, and we've indicated a whole lot of activities. And each one of these is finished to start, by the way. We're just going to use finish to start for everything that we do, nothing more than that. So um, obviously A has to happen before B, then A and B, then M. So these are some of the paths. Let's map some of the paths through this diagram. There are, in fact, 11 paths, but let's see how many we can map just really quickly. I'll use different colors. So we've got begin, A, B, end. That's one path through this network diagram. Um, here's another path, begin, A, C, D, E, end. Another path would be begin, A, F, G, end. That's another path, begin, A, I, J, end. So these are all paths through the di um, network diagram. So I'll write those ones that we've got there, A, B, end. Obviously, they've all got begin at the beginning of them. Um, next one would be begin A, C, D, E, end. That's a path through the diagram. Begin A, I do not see we've done that. Uh, F, G, end, and so on. So we can start to map them. And then, of course, you've got other paths running this way um, with begin. Um, we'll do a little color there. Begin H F G end. Begin H C G E end. Begin H I J end. Um, and then you could have another path there. I'll change the color again. Begin K C D E end. Begin K F G end. It's not really colorful now. Begin K I J end. Begin K L J end. So these are all the paths. That's what we say when what is the path through the diagram. Um, if you follow the activities, one or more of these, once we've done the calculation, will be the critical path. Um, and that's what we're going to figure out. Which one of these path or paths will in fact be the critical path? Okay. Now there's one more thing that I, I need to tell you. So we've done precedence, relationships, finish to start, we've done types of dependencies. Um, mandatory discretionary internal and external and the other thing to tell you about is leads and lags so this is another thing you can take into account now leads and lags refer to the amount of time that a successor activity must wait after its predecessor ends that's a lag or how much time the successor activity can start before the completion of its predecessor that's a lead so what does that look like graphically well if this was our activity and it was activity we'll call it um uh, activity A. So this is activity A. Okay. Right. Okay. And let's say that we've got a successor activity and our successor activity is activity B. And we want to indicate a lag between them. So this means that activity B must wait. So we put it over here. This would be activity B now. Like that. And what we do is we'd clearly indicate a um, like that. Okay. Now the lag is what we would indicate by this um, gap here. I'll just change the color so we can see it. That gap there. That duration is our lag. So if each of those was say ten days long, ten days long, we could be saying the lag is five days long. So the successor activity, activity B, is a finish to start relationship, but it can't start for five days until A has finished. 
We often see this with things like um, house building and concrete. So A could be pour the concrete, B could be start building on the concrete, but there must be a lag there to allow the concrete to dry. It's not an activity that we can assign resources, cost or time to, so it's just simply a lag. So that's what it would be. And if we were programming it in the software um, and say activity A, instead of being activity A was number 27 and uh, activity B was uh, task number 28, like that, what we would do in the program in the software in the predecessors column, we would write that activity 28 is dependent on activity 27, finish to start FS plus, in this case, five days. That's how you would program it in the predecessors column. Okay, I'm going to be down here though, like that. So activity B, we're telling the software that it's dependent on activity 27, finish to start, but it's a lag of five days. So that's how we would do it. But in the other module that I show you, uh, the screen capture of doing um, a Gantt chart, we've got all that information there, how to program that predecessor column and which parts to touch and which not to touch. So that's a lag. What is if we wanted to make this um, a lead? Well, what we could do this time is bring activity B here. Um, I'll get rid of some of these. I'm getting quite good at using this annotating tool now. Um, this time, what we're saying is, um, I'll get rid of that. Okay. So this time, what we're saying is B is still the successor activity, but um, what we're saying here is B can start a few days before the end of A. In fact, it can start this many days here before the end of A. So that's what we would put there. And in this case, to indicate a lead, we would, um, instead of writing plus, we would go 27, finish to start, minus, say, three days. And that would indicate our lead as well. So that's the difference between leads and lags um, there as well. So all good things to know to program your schedule. So once we've done all of that, we've um, sequenced the activities, put them all in, we have our network diagram, but it is still not our project schedule. Absolutely not yet. We've still got to do some more work on it, okay? So here's a network diagram, but it's not a schedule because we don't know the duration of all of these yet. We haven't told it how, long, how many days or weeks each of these will take. So even though we've got a network diagram and we can see relationships and we can see paths, um, we still don't know how long it takes to get from concept plans here to hand over there. And we won't know that until we do our um, critical path analysis. So that's what we're looking for. Let's talk a little more, though, about this wonderful thing called the critical path. So I'm just clicking that to see what it does. Um, Right, let's take a look at our wonderful thing and try and figure out why do I keep referring to this thing called the critical path. It's funny because um, a few years ago I was sitting on a plane and um, the person next to me asked, um, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a, I'm a project management consultant. And they said, ah, critical path. And I said, oh, are you a project manager? Go, no, no, I just work for them and that's all I know about it. So that was quite humorous that all this person associated with the entire profession of project management was the term critical path. Um, so what exactly is the critical path? The critical path is the path through a network diagram or paths, it can be multiple critical paths, where if there's any delay on any of the activities on the critical path, the project duration is increasing. And that's why if time is important to your project, that's why you want to identify the critical path. Um, but maybe time is not important to your project, but for a lot of projects, obviously it is. And identifying the critical path is really important. So you can place extra attention to those things, those um, activities which are on the critical path, because they represent the greatest risk to you achieving your expected duration. Um, you can have more than one critical path, um, but they'll always be the same length and it will always be the longest or paths. I know um, we used to teach in the PMP exam, if you were presented with a, a critical path diagram 
and you didn't have time to work out the entire network diagram, a good rule of thumb was if you could quickly figure out all the paths and add up the durations for each path, um, the, the longest one would, would be the critical path, if that's what the question was asking. So that's why we focus on the critical path. Okay, so here is the critical path shown in the software. This is back to Project Libre again. Here we are, Project Libre. And Project Libre by default has critical path switched on. Um, and anything here in red is on the critical path. So here you'll see pretty much everything in this project. There's only a few things which are actually blue. So anything in red on this particular project is on the critical path. Um, I, know, I think it's uh, with Microsoft Project Critical Path you actually have to turn on. Um, it doesn't come on by default, as I recall, but with Project Libre, there it is there. So all of these activities are on the critical path. Should any one of them be delayed, the project duration here planned to end on the 3rd of July um, will increase. And that's why we focus on the critical path. Okay, now in order to do our critical path analysis though, we need to get our activity durations in there. And here they are here, by the way. Here they are in the software right here. Okay, now just a, a word of caution, never play with these columns here. Okay, this is what the software is doing, is doing all of that um, automatically. Anything here that's grayed out, don't do that. Don't put any information there because the software is doing that all automatically. You're only going to put in this information here, these durations here and under here, and you're going to tell the software the predecessor relationships. That's the basic amount of information you're going to tell the software. It's going to take care of all of this automatically based on what you tell it um, and do all of this automatically. I only say that because I've had somebody in the past um, tell me that they didn't like using the software because every time there was a change, they had to go back into this area here and update everything. When I pointed out to them, you do know it does that automatically. Uh, they were both surprised and horrified uh, that they did not know that. So please, um, we're going to put our duration estimates here. And how do we get those? Nice and easy. We go back to those estimating techniques that we covered in the other module. We choose the appropriate estimating technique based on the amount of information we've got and the amount of accuracy or certainty we want in it. So you will use your team, you'll use important stakeholders, you'll sit down with them, you'll show them the activities, and then you'll have a great discussion with them about what is the duration estimate for this particular activity using the particular estimating technique. So if you haven't done that module yet, you do need to go back and do that module. So head on back at some point and do that. Um, and for me, if I'm doing a project schedule and I want it to be relatively accurate, I'm going to be looking at parametric estimating, bottom-up estimating, published estimating data, expert judgment, lessons learned. Um, and maybe for a few, I have used um, the three-point estimates, the optimistic plus four times the realistic plus the pessimistic divided by six. So I'll use those estimating techniques. Um, if you find yourself using the ballpark figure or the uh, rough order of magnitude estimate, um, probably means you don't have a lot of information. And obviously, if, if you recall from that module, it means that particular duration estimate will have a lot of uncertainty into it. So that's what you're going to do. And that's the last bit of information that we need to put together our project schedule. So now that we have all of this information, we can now put together our project schedule. So let's work through it. Now, this is going to take some time. Um, and it's strange delivering it virtually because usually I deliver this with a big whiteboard and we get to talk and I get to show you. But I'm try and pay attention here. And if you do have any questions at all, just let me know. And with all the other modules, the invitation is here to contact me and, and I'll do whatever I can to walk you through all of this. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with this information. Okay. So here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine tasks or activities. So it's a fairly small network diagram. Most network diagrams have tens or hundreds. Um, I worked on one a few years ago for a new wind farm, and it had like um, like five or six hundred activities over three years, and it was brilliant. Um, that was a great guy who was a professional scheduler, and he was using Primavera was the software he was using. Um, 
that for the whole three years he controlled that whole project and that was his one job was scheduling so you can go find a scheduling expert and i know that um, for example the project management institute does have the uh, pmi um, sp or scheduling professional credential so there are people who specialize in this so but for our example we're just going to use these what did I say? Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These nine activities. Um, here we've got our duration estimates there. We've done our duration estimating using our particular estimating technique. We're dealing with days here. We've also indicated the predecessor relationships between them. So activity B is dependent on A. Activity C is dependent on A and B. Um, D is dependent on B, E is dependent on C and D, F is the successor, D is the predecessor, G is the successor, E is the predecessor, H is the successor, F and G are predecessors to H, and finally the last activity, the activity I, um, it has two predecessors, G and H. So that's what we're going to do. Now the way we're going to draw the activity on node diagram, we're going to use a node to represent all the information. We're going to put all the information to a single node, uh, a single square box. Um, and that node is going to have this information in it as we go through it. OK, so this is the information in the node. And um, you'll see different textbooks. They all have the same information in it. Some of them will flick it around. Um, but the, what, the thing that will always stay common is the top left hand corner will always be the early start which is the earliest an activity can start, depending on the relationship with its predecessors. The top right-hand corner will always be early finish, which is the earliest it can finish. Um, and then the bottom left-hand corner will always be the late start, the latest it can start. And then late finish will always be the bottom right-hand corner. Some people um, have the task ID running like this, and you have duration or float over there and, or float there. Um, now, just on the word float, I'm going to use the word float. You can use the word float or slack. It's up to you. Um, it was an anomaly for many years in the Pimbok guide that it was one of the only words in the whole guide where there were two words to mean the same thing. And if you've watched the first module about project management foundations, you would have um, heard me talk about the origins of the Pimbok guide and its attempt to not be prescriptive. It's not a methodology. It's not how to do projects. It's simply an attempt in one document um, well, up to version six um, in one document to collect what most people consider best practice most of the time, but it recognized there were lots of other ways of doing things, or you could call one thing like the project charter, the mandate initiation document, but it chose project charter. I just like to think humorously during that whole process, um, they came across a float and slack and they went, right, what are we going to call it? Float or Slack? Um, what does most of the world call it? And they did their analysis and they went, oh, heck, it's 50-50. And oh, we're going to call it Float or Slack. So it's one of the very few words that used to exist in the glossary that there were two words to mean the same thing. I'll use the word Float. Uh, float. I, sometimes I use the word Slack and I'll probably do that here. Uh, it just means the amount of um, time uh, that the successor activity has before the predecessor, um, how much time it's got to... Um, can be delayed before it affects the next activity in line or the end duration in line. Okay, so that's how we're going to do it. So let's start putting together our network diagram step by step. So this is our basic network diagram. Now I've gone ahead and organized this with the information that we had. A is uh, the, the beginning task. It has two successes, B and C. If you remember the table, um, C has one successor, E, but it has two predecessors, B and A. And here's the duration we've indicated. So A is three days long, B is six days long, D is four days long, et cetera, et cetera. And I out here is eight days long. So that's the information that starts our network diagram. But there's still a lot of information missing. Now, just to be clear, you'll never need to do a network diagram, just to be clear. So I should have made that clear. Um, this is what your software is doing for you once you program it completely. But if you don't know this, you won't be able to use the software competently. And that's why it's good to know this. But um, no, you'll never need to do a network diagram. Um, I like to joke sometimes, maybe you're at a party on a Friday night and the conversation's drying up and to get it going, you say, hey, let's do a network diagram. Don't do that. 
Um, that's a bad project management joke. I've got to drop it. Okay, so you'll never need to do this manually, um, but it's really important that you know how it all works manually so you get a better understanding of what the software is doing. That's the whole point of this, by the way. Okay, so we've got the basic information. We've got our relationships. We've got our paths. So let's take a look at some of the paths for this diagram. Um, a, uh, B, D, F, oh no, um, it's not F, uh, uh, F, and H, and I, there's one path. Uh, what's the other path? Um, A, B, C, E, G, H, I, but it's also a direct path there, isn't it? To A, B, C, E, G, straight to I as well. Um, okay, so that's the A. Do I, do I miss any of those? A, B, D, F, A, A, B, A, B, C, E, G. Got those ones. Right, let's have a look. Bring that up over here. Okay. Um, let's go the other route now. A, C, E, G, H, H, I, and of course there's the shorter route. A, C, E, G, straight to I. I feel like I've missed one. A, B, the A, B, the A, B, D, F, H, I, A, B, oh, there's one, I missed one. Well, let's say we go here, A, B, hopefully you're yelling this out at me, going, Sean, you missed one. A, B, D, E, G, well, we've got both H and H, I, so we'll go um, H, and then A, B, D, E, G, I, and of course I missed the I up here. Oh, there we are. Okay, so I think that's it. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven paths through this diagram. Which one is the critical path? That's what we're going to try and figure out. Okay, but in order to figure it out, first thing we need to do is do what's called a forward pass. Now, with a forward pass, we're going to work from left to right, from this end, and we're going to go that way. That's a forward pass. And we're going to fit, we're going to work on the early start and early finishes. So by the time we get through this diagram, we would have found out our project duration, which is the number that will appear in that top right-hand box of the last activity. Okay, so this is how you do it. Now, there are two numbering systems for this. Um, this is the numbering system I use, which most textbooks use. There are some textbooks which use a slight variation on this, and I'll try and explain it. Okay. So, activity A can start at the beginning of day one. So, remember this, the beginning of day one. It's three days long. So, when can it end? Now, a lot of people go, well, you just add three to one, don't you? Well, no, because if it starts at the beginning of day one, so that's day one, day two, day three, it ends at the end of day three. Okay. Now, the other numbering system actually starts on zero. And put, we'll put zero in here, and then you just add three to zero and have three there. But then you need to have three here as well and double up, basically. You have three there. Okay, so we're going to use this numbering system, which says that activity A starts at the beginning of day one. It's three days long, so day one, day two, day three. The earliest it can finish is at the end of day three. Now, the success of B, the earliest it can start is at the beginning of day four. It's six days long. So day four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It ends at the end of day nine. So it's this plus this minus one. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And if we do that, we can see that activity D, the earliest it can start, depending on its predecessors, it can start on day, the beginning of day 10. It's four days long, day 10, 11, 12, 13. So it can end at the end of 13. But let's take a look at activity C. The earliest it can start, now it would love to start here on day four, but it can't because it's also got another predecessor here and it has to wait for both of them. So even though it does have to wait for A, it also has to wait for B. 
So the earliest it can start is not day four, it's also day 10. It can start at the beginning of day 10 because its latest predecessor finishes at the end of day nine. So keep an eye out for that. So going through here, task F, it's got one predecessor, so it can start at the beginning of day 14. It's two days long, so it's day 14, 15 is at the end of day 15. Here, task E has two predecessors. So we have to look at the early finish for both of them. Now, it would love to start on day 12 after C ends, but it can't because it also has to wait for the end of task D, which ends at the early finish is the end of day 13. So the earliest it can start is, in fact, the beginning of day 14. Am I losing it yet? Because I know it gets quite complex. Thank goodness the software is doing it all for us. Okay. So you do all of that. You work that through. Um, task H has got two predecessors. So it would love to start at the beginning of day 16 um, after task F, but it also has to wait for G. So at the earliest it can start is, in fact, day 23. And from that, task I has two predecessors, H and G. It would love to start on day 23 but it can't. It also has to wait for this one to end at the end of day 25, so it can start at the beginning of day 26. It's eight days long, so now we've figured out our total project duration, which is 33 days. That's the forward pass. Um, thanks for paying attention to that, but it's going to get a little more complicated now because we're about to do a backward pass to figure out the critical path. Okay, so yeah, if you want to do this manually, um, do it, and if you do go to sit the PMP exam, by the way, you do need to know this. There may be a question in the PMP exam which expects you to have the ability to figure out the network diagram. Now we're going to do a backward pass. Okay, so the previous one was a forward pass where we calculated the early start and early finish and we move from left to right. A backward pass is the opposite, it moves from right to left. And we're going to calculate the late finish and the late start for every activity. Okay. Just make sure I click the slide there accidentally. Yeah, we did click the slide accidentally. Right. Revealed too much too quickly. So here we are. Now, the last activity, the late finish and the late start are always the same as the early start and the eight, um, early finish. So they're 33, 33, 26, 26. Now we want to work backwards and we want to take a look at the predecessor activities. Now, here's a sentence I've been saying teaching for about 20 years. I love saying it because it still confuses me to say it, but this is how you calculate the late finish. Here we go. Pay attention. The late finish for any activity is one day before the smallest late starts of all of the successor activities. Yep. I, I love saying it because it's really confusing. What does that mean? When you're trying to calculate the late start, you have to look at all the successors. In this case, there's only one successor, that's I. So the late start here can be one day before the smallest of the successes late starts. In this case, only one twenty-six. So the late start is twenty-five. You get the late or the late finish. Sorry, is twenty-five. Okay, so late finish here is one day before the late start of that one, and you get the late start just by simply subtracting the duration of that and adding one, doing the reverse. What we did there. Or another quick tip is the difference between these two numbers will always be the difference between these two numbers. So there's zero difference between that. There will always be zero difference between that. Now let's take a look at activity G. We want to calculate the late finish here. So we've got to look at both successor activities. I, the late start is 26. H, the late start is 23. So we want the smaller of those two, which in this case is 23. So the late start for G is in fact 22, not 25. Is 22. You've got to look at all the successes, choose the smallest late start, and that's where the late finish for that one is. There's no difference between those two, so there'll be no difference. So 18 is the late start there. Working backwards, nice and easy for E, there's only one successor. Its late start is 18, so its late finish is 17. Nothing between those two, so that's 14 there as well. Um, if its late finish was well, only one successor, and that's task H. So it's um, late start is 23, so it's late finish is 22. Great. Um, C only has one successor, that's task E. And um, it's late start is 14, therefore the late finish there is 13. But now let's take a look at D. 
Task D has two successes, tasks F and E. So we have to find the smallest late start. So F has a late start of 21, E has a late start of 14. So this is the one we want. So the late start for D is one day before 14, so it's 13. So the zero between that, so the zero between this. Task B has two successes as well, task D and task uh, C. So we want the smallest late start. So 12 and 10, we want 10. So that's nine for late finish. And finally, task A has two successes, tasks B and task C. You want to find the smallest late start, 12, four. So we want four. So it's late finish is three and there's one. I feel like I should yell, wake up now. Um, but there we are. So that's the backward pass. And then the last thing we want to do is fill in these last blanks, which is calculating the float or slack for each of those. And that's really easy to do. You just subtract this from this. That's all you got to do. Just go through. It doesn't matter if you subtract the late finish from the early finish or the late start from the early finish. It will give you the same number as you can see. So we go through that. Um, that's the next thing we do. So let's do that quickly. Um, and here you can see the float is zero, float is zero, so the zero, um, here's seven days float though. So this means that task F, the earliest it can finish is day 15, but it's got seven days float in it. So that late finish of day 22 means it can be delayed by up to seven days before it affects the next activity in line and delays that and eventually delays this. So that's why we like activities with slack or float. Um, here's another activity with slack or float, task C, or activity C has got two days slack or float, which means the earliest it can finish is day 11, the latest it can finish is day 13, before it impacts the next one in line, okay? But what we're really looking for is the activities with no slack or float, because that'll tell us the critical path. So let's just circle each of the activities that have zero slack or float. There they are. And that is our critical path. We get that A, B, D, E, G, H, I, A, B, D, E, D, E, G, H, I. That is our critical path. So there we are. Any activity on there has zero slack or float in it, which means should one of them slip or be delayed, this end duration is increasing. Okay. And that really is why we and how we do critical path. So that's it. So there's our critical path. But again, I do want to stress, you're never going to need to do this manually. It's, it's only for nerds like me, I guess. Um, I get excited maybe the same way that people do when they do Sudoku puzzles. Um, I get excited figuring out network diagrams, seeing that forward pass, the backward pass. Um, and it gets really complicated. You know, obviously we've defaulted everything here to a, a straight finish to start without leads or lags. Um, you imagine how complicated it gets trying to figure it out manually once you've got leads and lags and you know finish to finish or start to start relationships in there too. Um, and you can see why the software is so valuable. Um, feel sorry for those people back in Henry Gantt's day who tried to do all of this very manually, um, but the software does it all for you. So there we are. Okay, so now you've got your project schedule, you've identified your critical path, you know your project duration, you know activities on the critical path. That's fantastic. But be warned, um, I remember years ago, I did all of this for a great project and went to the project sponsor and said it's going to take 27 weeks to do this project. And uh, the project sponsor said, well, we need it done in 20. And I said, yeah, but we've gone through um, activity um, lists, we've done duration estimates, we use the team, have done it before, we got the clients involved, um, we've done all of our duration estimates, which are defensible, we've done our network diagram, it's 27 weeks. And uh, Simon was his name, and he said, no, it's got to be done in 20. And it had to be done in 20, he had decided, um, explained why. So at that point, if somebody does come to you and say, look, I appreciate you've done this wonderful network diagram, and that's your optimal schedule, but you're going to need to do it faster, which often happens for many reasons. You've generally got a few choices here, very generic choices. What you can do is what we refer to as either crashing, fast tracking, or simply doing less. So crashing means adding more resources to the project. 
um, to get things done faster. But crashing costs money because you may need to ask people to work overtime or weekends, or you may need to bring in contractors, uh, or you may, if you're doing a construction project, you may need to bring in more machinery to do it faster. You may need to hire machinery or lease machinery or buy machinery. So it generally costs more money. So if you're coming in under budget, it may be an option or the sponsor's prepared to approve more money, that's fine. That's crashing. Now, as a general rule of thumb though, um, don't assume that doubling the resources halves the time. It doesn't work like that. So if you've got um, two software developers and you bring in four software developers, you're four in total, it doesn't mean you generate the code twice as fast. It's not how the maths work. And it's the same for construction projects. If you've got two diggers um, doing a job and you bring in another two diggers for a total of four, it doesn't mean you dig twice as fast. There's actually a whole complex science um, behind um, the percentage increase in resources and the percentage speed um, increase. So it's not just simply like that. So that's crashing. Um, generally costs money. Fast tracking is interesting. Fast tracking is where, remember those um, discretionary dependencies I mentioned earlier on? Fast tracking is where you would generally do activities in sequence so activity a and or activity a and activity b but you decide to take a risk and instead of doing finish to start you decide to bring one forward um, and even do them simultaneously or certainly with a lead so that's fast tracking obviously it increases risk about it and then the last one you can do if you're really pressured is simply get an agreement that you can do less and this means just like releasing the minimum viable uh, or coming back and finishing things after it's been used or things like that. Um, you need to get agreement, obviously, from the right stakeholders there, the project sponsor, the client, um, to do any and all of that, though. So those are your options if you need to do things fast in order to compress or speed up the schedule. Um, just in terms of presenting the schedule, as a general rule of thumb, uh, don't present Gantt charts to senior management. There's far too much information in your typical Gantt chart. That's typically not the information they want to see. Um, so what I would recommend for uh, senior management is something like a milestone chart, where you just break down the major milestones and tell them progress towards the milestones. So it's a nicer and easier graphical way. But yeah, just keep that in mind as a general rule of thumb, don't take a whole Gantt chart to a management meeting. Um, People just get bogged down in the detail. So maybe use a milestone chart. Now, just a quick and special mention of um, Agile um, methods. Agile doesn't tend to use Gantt charts um, because of the uncertainty. Gantt charts work best with predictive environments where there's more certainty over the work to be done and the order in which the work is going to be done initially. Whereas obviously with agile, adaptive or iterative approaches, there's not so much certainty about what work's going to be done in what order, because with iteration or sprint planning, you may choose which items out of the product backlog that are going to come through into that particular sprint or iteration. So there's other different ways of um, tracking time or progress in agile. Um, the most common ones are the velocity chart, and the burn down chart, which is the next slide. Now, the interesting thing about both of these is they can tell you how fast you're going and any changes in speed or velocity, which is good that this is all of good information to know, but they don't tell you when the project is due to end. That's one of the problems that you sometimes get with agile teams is they can't tell you when the project's going to end. Now, um, there is some great, there are some great tools out there that will allow you to do that. Um, and I do think you need to find those tools because I do think it's an excuse that agile teams use. Oh, we don't know how long this project's going to take. Well, you can, because you can track things like the number of user stories you are doing per sprint or iteration. You can have a rough idea of the total estimate of user stories or user story points that this particular feature or epic requires and from that you can you should be able to get an estimate of duration there might be more uncertainty of that estimate but you should be able to get a rough estimate of duration and then obviously as you go through and you track time with things like a velocity chart here and a burn down chart you can start to refine that by knowing how many story points you actually are completing per iteration or sprint and then using that once again with the remaining number of story points to figure out when you might end 
So the first one here amongst all of that, um, as you can tell, I'm a big advocate for agile teams at least giving rough order of magnitude estimates of when this project's going to end and simply not throwing the hands in the air and going, oh, we're agile, we don't do that. That's, that's bad practice. Um, so velocity chart, um, here you're doing how many story points completed each sprint or iteration. Um, and in this case, you should see the velocity increasing to an optimum amount. And here we're tracking what was committed and what was completed. Um, so here in sprint two, we didn't do all the story points, nor in sprint three, but then in sprint four, we exceeded it. Um, and then obviously we set it into a nice routine as the team found its way of working and got into it. So you can track velocity and it should, it generally does that a velocity chart. Um, so that's special to Agile. And then the other one too is the burn down chart. Um, so the burn down chart is a way of representing the amount of work left to be done in an iteration or sprint. Um, and here, obviously this particular sprint chose 20 story points. And then as you went through and did each of the um, user stories, um, so the line down is typically like this, linear, but the work being done isn't always linear. But you want to try and stay below this line here, the estimated line, because if you're continually staying above it, that means you're not probably going to get all the story points done in that particular sprint or iteration. So that's a burn down chart. So um, yeah, so that's agile um, there. But remember the key message is there are a number of tools. Um, and there are tools for estimating when a project may finish and you simply don't go, we don't do time estimation in Agile. Okay, so there we are. We've come to the end of this module uh, on doing a schedule. I know it's a, a complicated module, um, lots of technical information in there. But let's see if you've been paying attention. Let's see if you can match the words on the left here with the definitions on the right. Here they are here. Okay. So forward pass, critical path, slack, finish to start relationship and Gantt chart. And you've got A, B, C, D, or E. So take a look at those. I'll give you a few moments to get the first one. What is a forward pass? Is it A, the path or paths through a network diagram with no slack or float on any activity? Is it B, a relationship between two activities where the successor can start? Can't start and is that a spelling mistake there too? Until the predecessor is complete. That should be can't, so read that, can is can't. Um, I'm tired of finding these small mistakes in these slides. Um, a horizontal bar chart showing the sequence and independence of project activities. Is it the amount of time an activity can be delayed before it impacts the success of activities? Or is it a method of calculating total project duration using the early start and early finish in a network diagram? Hopefully, you said that a forward pass was E a method of calculating total project duration using the early start and early finish of the network diagram. What about critical path? To A, B, C, or D? Yeah. Hopefully, you said the critical path is A, the path or path through a network diagram with no slack or float on any activity. What about slack? Is it B, C, or D? Hopefully, you said that slack or float is D. The amount of time an activity can be delayed before it impacts the successor activities. What about finish to start relationship and Gantt chart? What's, what's a Gantt chart? Is it B or C? Hopefully you said it's a horizontal bar chart showing the sequence and interdependence of project activities, C. And that means that a finish to start relationship is a relationship between two activities where the successor can start. Um, or can't start, sorry, until the predecessor is complete. I'll fix that spelling mistake up. So there we are. Um, look, some extra tips. I did mention Project Libre. Um, you can go download it from projectlibre.com. Now, at the time of writing or recording this, if you put www in, it didn't work. You literally have to go to projectlibre.com without the dub 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 at the beginning. I don't know why that works some, for some URLs. Um, look, it's a great piece of open source software. It's fully supported. Uh, a commitment from the developers and the community that supports it to never sell it commercially. Um, it's malware free. And at the time of uh, recording this, they were just releasing the cloud version, which came with a small fee. So you could put all your projects onto the cloud. But to download the software into Project Libre, it's absolutely free. 
Um, the laptop that I'm using to record all of these sessions has Project Libre installed on it. I've used it for years. As I mentioned before, it will open Microsoft Project and save as Microsoft Project files and has 80 to 90% of the functionality of Microsoft Project, everything you need to do. Um, just be aware though that if you are using a work computer with uh, software uh, or security lockdowns on it, you probably won't be able to install it because it is an open source piece of software. But I certainly run it on my laptop uh, and quite happy to run it. Um, and also just a reminder that you can go looking for the other module that I've already mentioned several times where I've done a screen capture. It's about 20 minutes long, 20, 25 minutes long of me setting up a Gantt chart in Project Libre um, and talking you, you through it. So that is available. So please, if you want to know more about that, go looking for it as well just in the library of um, training modules. So look, just recapping, um, obviously, as you've seen, time, module, time management, schedule development can be quite technical. Forward passes, backward passes, lags, leads, slacks, floats, early starts, early finishes, um, into, you know, um, precedence relationships, uh, finish to start, all of those things can be very technical. But it is really worth the time to put all that work in up front to get a project schedule done. Because then you can track if something's not tracking, you can choose to act on it. Um, now you don't need to try and force things back onto the schedule. You can change the schedule, by the way. That's absolutely fine. Um, but to have the tools and techniques there to always be able to answer the question, how are you going with time? When do you think this project's going to finish? What issues are you having? So please do get competent at whatever software you've got access to um, in your workplace. And I've mentioned the big ones, you know, Project Primavera, Libre, but a lot of um, project management software that does all project management now comes with it and built. Um, and the last tip I will leave you with is most people use Microsoft Project for about 5% of what it can actually do. It's an incredibly sophisticated bit of software that can track um, everything about your project. It can track, obviously, schedule, but it can do resources, it can do costs. Um, it can do regular reporting, it can integrate with other bits of software. So if you are going to get time uh, or I are going to use the effort to get good at the software, really get good at it. Um, I get frustrated when I see people use Microsoft Project for basically the equivalent of using Microsoft Excel to add up a row of 20 numbers. Um, most of that scheduling software is incredibly powerful, it can run all aspects of your project as well. So anyway, that's my final tip. Um, look, thank you very much for sticking through to the end on this module. Uh, obviously, I'm grateful that you've chosen to go through this module. And as with every any other module that I've done or that you've, you've watched or listened to, um, you know you're able to contact me by email or send me a message. And I, I will do my best to get back to you as fast as possible to answer any of your questions. Um, obviously, if you spot any other errors in these slides, drop me an email to um, it's frustrating these slides have been using them for years and it's annoying just to see these little wee spelling mistakes still in there but anyway look once again thank you so much for your time and attention and um yeah have a great rest of the day thanks a lot